Welcome to Creative Innovators with Gigi Johnson. On this week's episode, we will be enjoying the story of how Zambezi Partners was founded by Bastian Den Braber and Jenna Seiden, two people who I knew separately through UCLA, but who've come together to enmesh relationship management, virtual reality, and anti-poaching into their new adventures. You'll hear their stories of what inspired them, but also what brought them together. And if you hear this before December 13th, 2020, come find EndangeredRangers.com and their live show that they're going to be doing that day. In the meantime, enjoy this show and enjoy their adventures on Creative Innovators. So can you start us out with what the heck you guys are doing together and how you both met? Start with the what you're doing together. Ah, well, that's easy. Um, so uh, we founded uh, CBC Partners, which is has the is a benefits corporation with the mission to eradicate uh, African wildlife poach, uh, poaching during our lifetime. And uh, we do three things under that banner. One is we do consulting work together in the emerging technology space. And uh, we have the CBC project, which curates and integrates anti-poaching technologies from global technology companies, Cisco, Microsoft, Intel, and sorts. And we deploy that uh, at conservation projects in Africa. And uh, we're launching an investment fund, CBC Ventures, to do investments in the same areas where we do projects with the CBC project. And um, that's what we're doing primarily together. And uh, we met. Uh, both starting to work for a Dutch venture capital firm, Lumo Labs. And that was back in June or so, 2018. So I'm going to have you unpack all of those activities a little later in our conversation. But you both are, I was going to say wizards in immersive reality tech but both came from interesting backgrounds. Can I have, and I think I've known Jenna longer. Jenna, can you talk about how you got into this arena and what adventures you've been through? Sure. Um, I have always loved technology. However, I'm also a storyteller and I wove my way to where I am today, starting off by a, Oddly enough, uh, at the National Basketball Association, graduating from school right into being an assistant at the NBA. But I will tell you that everything that I do every day is what I learned at my very first job. Uh, David Stern, the commissioner, taught me how to look holistically at a media company and what are the ways to tell the story of your brand. And after learning from him, I went to grad school. I went from New York City to Los Angeles, where I met you when I was uh, at the Anderson School of Business at UCLA. And uh, while I went to school full time, I knew that graduating uh, with an MBA was nice, but I wanted to be on the creative side of Hollywood. So I interned a lot, worked at NBC or the newest digital startup called Icebox during my MBA summer. Um, I worked at a talent agency to see what the selling side was. So basically I wanted to see all selling, buying, and content creation. And I ended up being a talent agent at the Creative Artists Agency after my stints at some of the networks and other places. And I was a video game agent. They, for some reason, said, you seem like you can figure something out. Go go explore these new tech platforms and try to get our storytellers on there. And it was a dream job. Um, It was to help these creators tell their stories the right way on new platforms. And all the new platforms were digital or video games or now burgeoning VR. And I was able to translate my Hollywood career into technology by going to Microsoft and seeing what it's like to work for a very binary ones and O's company uh, coming from a very gray space of Hollywood. And from there went to the next new platform, Maker Studios, and helped 15 million assets created by 55,000 YouTubers get out into the world. And um, I've lastly got into the specific interactive of VR after video games because half of the video game industry decided to explore virtual reality 
And I said, that's cool. That's the next thing. I went there and worked at HTC running content strategy for a brand new consumer facing headset. And today uh, I consult with Boss across platforms and content creators at the intersection of media and technology, just helping storytellers, be it entertainment or consumer facing, uh, tell their stories the right way and the right platforms and uh, do those business deals so that they have fair deals and more content gets made. And I ran into you again at Foil when you were with HTC and you yes. were trying to work with all the people trying to figure out how to bring this into out of home, not just sitting in your own basement with a VR headset on, but getting people to get immersed in an immersive environment. Very, very true. The, the adoption of in-home headsets, a little slower than, than, than people projected. And there's a disconnect, and there still is one today, that the best way to get people to understand this immersive technology is to try it. And where are they going to try it? Well, pre-COVID, that was out of home. But for some reason, and not for some reason, for many reasons at different headset manufacturers, wherever they were in the world, they, they didn't embrace that. And my passion a little bit was location-based entertainment because, ironically, my father, when I was a child in the 80s, owned an arcade. And I oh, said, cool. you know what? <laughs> yeah. I said, you know what? Um, I think this is where there should be VR arcades. And, you know, there are mom and pop independent ones. And then there's the Dave and Busters at the next level. Let's explore those. So, yes, I, I was a big proponent. I still am. Uh, I think the industry will come back. But, um, yes, I think people have to try these things and do that out of home. Exactly. So I, I'm still fighting, fighting the good fight. Uh, but it's uh, not a priority on the roadmap for many of the headset manufacturers right now. But uh, it's it'll it'll find its way. So I find so we have a lot of people on this show that have arcs that kind of loop that they come back into things that they were passionate about as young people. What were you a tech person, a gamer, a story creator? I mean, do you come from your commented your dad ran an arcade a technology or a creative family um <laughs> my father was a small town lawyer who had a client called the connecticut leather company and piece of trivia the connecticut leather company became coleco which made cabbage patch kids and the coleco vision game console and my father is a very non-technical person but is a beautiful writer and storyteller uh, has a way with words. So I came from a very, you know, liberal arts family of a lawyer and a teacher mother. But the moment my father came into the basement and offered me this game console, he didn't see me for the next two years until he came into the basement and said, I never see you. If I opened up an arcade, would I see you? And without looking to the right <laughs> and moving my head from Space Invaders, I said, sure, dad, that would be cool. So my dad opened up an arcade. Um, I've oh, always... I've always wanted to be more technical and code, and I did not know what an engineer was because it was, you'll be a teacher, or you'll be a lawyer. Uh, I came from that side of things. And so when I went to school, I thought engineers were, you know, train engineers. I didn't know what computer science was. It was just not, it was just a little naive of me. Uh, so I've always had an inclination for the tech, and I find it magical. And it's a puzzle to me. It's a game to me. So I love games. I was a gamer. I may have tuned out during the 90s a little bit when it went from 8-bit to um, graphics that are fascinating and amazing today using Unreal Game Engine and stuff. So there's a little period I stepped away. But I do know how to get double bullets in Space Invaders. And I'm pretty good at Red Dead Redemption and Grand Theft Auto, which is sort of embarrassing. But uh, Boss, on the other hand, compliments me nicely because he he does come from a little bit more of a technical side, and and, and so he can speak to that. But uh, it's been wonderful being able to combine my love of storytelling cause with tech. I've, I've always just wanted to tell stories, and if I can find a way to code it together, find someone. Anderson taught me how to hire people, so I know how to hire the right people for things, and it's wonderful. Cool, boss. When you're a small, tiny person, coder. Gamer, creative person, troublemaker? Uh, professional troublemaker, for sure. Um, uh, I was very much into, into a bunch of different sports as a, as a small person, but I also started with the first games that were out, that were available. My father had 
was in the industrial computing industry, and we had one of the first home PCs uh, that um, uh, was kind of at a residual from his office, or and it sometimes he used it at at home for his, uh, his home office, and uh, we found that pretty quickly. So the first games I played came on those big floppy drives um, and were things like California games and Space Invaders and uh, uh, Pac-Man and those kind of things. Those were literally the first... The, I played them the moment they came out. So yeah, I'm, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> and uh, did migrate over into the... Uh, the, the um, what are those big fighter games? Um, Oh man, what are those titles? Uh, some of them are still alive. Uh, Doom was one of the big ones, right? Um, so I did play all of those games extensively until even during my master's program, uh, I kind of flattened the, uh, the, the, the university campus network by getting 10 of my buddies to all play together in multiplayer, which at the time was kind of new and you can, <laughs> it was kind of guaranteed that the, uh, the campus network wasn't configured to host that. Um, so it went down a couple of times, um, but it was still good fun playing in between the up times. So where was this? Uh, so, uh, I did my bachelor degree. So I, I'm born and raised in the Netherlands, uh, did my bachelor degree in, in commercial engineering management in the Netherlands. And then I did my master's in general management in the Netherlands as well. So coming from definitely the more technical side of things, any creation on your backstory? Um, a little bit. I DJed for a couple of years, <laughs> but I, I didn't produce the songs myself. No, I'm, I'm very much a non-creative. Um, it, it gets me very anxious to try to create stuff. Um, I, I get also very anxious if the numbers and the technology aren't figured out. So that's really what I focus on. So uh, school for you is engineering. What were your next adventures? Um, so I went to work for a global consulting firm, um, and, uh, called, uh, Capgemini headquartered in France, um, one of the top five consulting firms. And I was with that firm for 15 years. So I spent, uh, nine years based in the Netherlands, but I traveled all over Europe for, for, for client, client work. And then, um, I was based in Dubai for three years, uh, worked in Middle East and Southeast Asia a little bit and Africa. And then I moved to the United States and uh, I worked for the firm here for another three years or so. Um, I was always focused on telecom media and entertainment clients. And um, that started to focus more and more. And that, that was very broad in terms of doing corporate strategy all the way to launching new uh, new fiber optic networks in the Middle East and, and everything in between that the telco does. And it started to more and more focus, particularly the last couple of years in the U.S., on digital strategy for large corporations and digital innovation. So let's say take a Johnson & Johnson. They had to figure out how they were going to be more innovative, more like the startup scene, but within a corporate context, that kind of stuff. And you talked about the loop before. Uh, there was an interesting loop um, in, 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 in my career. In the sense that um, in 2007, 8, 9, when the record labels all started to be uh, to be a severe pain, um, because obviously they were completely missing out on the digital business models. And uh, I did the corporate strategy for one of the four majors. Um, I was based in London. I was mostly for my responsibility was the, B, the B2B side, licensing and sync, uh, in short, in, in music industry language. And um, uh, that was probably one of the most interesting consulting projects I'd, uh, I'd, I've ever done in those 15 years. And um, after that project, which was a, about five months or so, a couple of months later, we were called back in to do due diligence on the strategy to see if it was actually implemented. Turned out it was only fractionally implemented, uh, which was uh, was foreseen. So we were ready to go. And then we were hired back to actually do the implementation of the strategy that we uh, that we put out. So all in all, over a period of three years, I spent a lot of time deep within the in the music industry with one of the four majors. And after that, I promised myself I would never ever work in the music industry again. And uh, but 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 that's not what you did. <laughs> that's not what I did. So here's where it loops. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I left the firm in uh, late 2015. Uh, delivered it didn't work for a couple of uh, couple of months, and as things happen in a city like 
I guess San Francisco or LA. I was based in LA and uh, I got into contact with a couple of people that are deep into the music industry and they were literally music video directors uh, working for A-list uh, talent and they we had this interesting discussion where they said, you know, it's these these uh, there's a whole you know established pipeline of when um, a music video needs to be created, right? It seeps through the, the label, gets commissioned to a music video commissioner, and then they find their producers that they always work with, and um, they get a budget and they create a music video, and it's it's a factory. Um, and these 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 directors and producers were like, well, the labels are coming to us, and they want these these VR videos and these 360 videos, and they don't really know what it is. They have exactly the same budget. We don't know how to do it. And that's when things started to click. And in that process, I met my, my co-founder uh, in, in the company that we you know, turned out to be Samo, um, which uh, you should ask uh, at some point about what the, the name implies. Um, what does the name imply? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> it's the, uh, the signature of, uh, of Basquiat, and it means uh, same old shit. <laughs> you know... Uh, of all these years, I've never asked you that before, so that's good to know. <laughs> um, and the beauty of it was that we presented this as this super, uh, you know, advanced, forward-thinking kind of high-tech uh, business, which it is, was, um, you know, we, we were literally filling out that, that gap that I learned that was there in the music industry from the consulting work I did, because... One thing I learned is that the creative is great and people know how to run with the creative and they can create, make products. They fundamentally have a large gap in understanding how to monetize things. And with VR, the exact same thing was happening, right? It was entirely predictable. It's like, we have great ideas. Here's the content. Here's the artist. We can produce it. Yeah. And then what? Right. But now we have the problem that it costs 10 to 20 times what it would cost to make a music video. Now we're not talking $25,000 for an A-list uh, uh, video. A uh, simple one, but we're talking half a million, a million, two million dollars to to create decent products. So we stepped into that void by creating the distribution plan, the overall strategy, and basically the, the final output and how to make money over the years to come, and then go back towards uh, financiers, uh, unleash the capital basically, and then package that and be able to go to artists and artist management and labels and say, this is the plan. There is funding if we do it this way and and and, and roll with that. Uh, so yeah, that's how the whole thing uh, looks back from never in the music industry again because of those reasons. And those very reasons became the, the premise of a startup that ended up being venture back. And then you are you then shifted gears and then you guys started working together. What is that journey story? Um, so there's about two year, uh, between me starting Samo and working in the, uh, uh, working that startup. And in, as part of the process, uh, I got connected with, uh, with Andy, who's one of the, uh, the general partners from the founders of Lumo Labs, the Dutch venture capital firm. Um, that's a whole story in its own, how the random bee ended up on my co-founder's desk who recognized the Dutch language and forwarded it to me. And then it's like, hey, these guys invest in AR, VR startups. So, and he's Dutch, so we need to talk because I need your money. Um, <laughs> and um, that happened to be more of a longer term relationship where um, after I did some work for the South African Broadcast Corporation in Johannesburg as a freelance consultant early 2018, I came back to L.A., and it was time to launch uh, Luma Labs in Los Angeles. And uh, that's uh, that's how uh, we started working here. And Jenna showed up here, thought I was the office manager, uh, ignored me for a large part and uh, ordered me to, to get her coffee and stuff. To, at some point, she realized there was more to me than uh, my coffee making skills. And that's how we started working together. <laughs> almost, almost accurate, but we'll go with that. <laughs> so... In many ways, listening to you guys' story and knowing you separately and not together, that you both have great superpowers in B2B business development in uh, changing sectors and changing industries. So a lot of people we've had on the show are very much solopreneurs. They don't have the big company background that they're trying to hack at the gates to try to do something different. You guys had ridden the road with different companies to see them 
attempt to change and deal with change. So you have a different vocabulary than a lot of people we've had on the show. How has that helped you in starting to build and plan what you decided to do together? The kind of understanding, grokking big companies and their challenges and needs. Yeah, that's, uh, and I'll, I'll let Jenna give her perspective, but I think that's a really good point you're pointing out because we have worked the insides and the outside of large corporations. So we know how they work. We know how they think. We know what you can get done, how, how long things take uh, and how to work their kind of corporate ecosystems. And that's something that is a, a mystery for people that have never been on the inside or closely working with them or in, in those companies. So that's, that's actually a really good point you're pointing out because that's, that is kind of part of our super strength that we can cut through the bullshit and, and, and make sense out of plans that we see a lot where people just assume they can get whatever they need from a large corporation, be it corporation, content, IP, partnerships, whatever it is. And they're often not based on very much on reality, but you need that being on the inside to be able to make sense out of those kind of things. Jenna, what about the super um, from your point of view? I'm very fortunate that I have some amazing big corporations on my resume. They, they mostly are acronyms, NBA, CAA, NBC, <laughs> Xbox. I swear I know how to spell full words, but um, I was always sort of my own division. So I was an intrapreneur, as a lot of people call it. And I was responsible for having to navigate within these companies. And that's what I bring to the table now, uh, partnering with Boss. When I was at CAA as a video game agent, we were building a brand new business. So while while Boss was working, you know, in the music industry, consulting at sort of the tail end at, at Capgemini, I was working on Rock Band and Guitar Hero and sort of coming up with the amazing along with a wonderful team what that genre is as a powerful one in that in that space and then today uh, i work with uh beat saber which is sort of the modern day virtual reality version of guitar hero and again these are all sort of startups and when i was doing that for these large companies now that i am outside of them and consulting and essentially running business development um you know, consulting with boss on these things, we definitely know how to navigate and use our networks. That's what we bring to the table when we work on a project together, not to, not to put our years and and our age on the table, but (laughs) a lot of these things that entrepreneurs need is purely relationships, how to talk to the right people, know how to speak the right way to the right person and what they need to be successful, what's a win for them, and then how to sort of, uh, and guide them. A lot of it is sort of just being maternal and paternal and explaining in a very nice way without being condescending. Listen, your understanding of how easy it is to get a license, or actually you have to think about these license fees, or this person needs this, and then you can have this happen. It's from years of having that experience. So in, in my opinion, you know, coming together when we met, consulting for Lumo Labs, we were essentially doing the same thing. We were always helping clients, mine were internal or and, and bosses were external, get things done and do those deals to make change and have forward progress. And it's it's really nice that, you know, at the same time, our business is one part consulting, one part a technology platform, one part an investment fund. It's it, sort of mirrors our triple bottom line strategy that we're able to take all of this experience from our professional careers and our passions and use it to benefit, you know, as Voss said, something good in the world that we care about. But it's, uh, it's, it's really that combination of network, in my opinion, and being an entrepreneur from my side of the table that I'm able to help and complement what Boss does and bring it to our clients and bring it when we're trying to change the world and do something and find new ways to do things. Yeah. And it also we works don't like a, legacy businesses. We like to innovate. And it also works a little bit the other way around, right? So we have the large, some of the largest, mostly technology corporation in the world that come to us and say, Hey, how can we use our technology within sort of the, 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 the entertainment market is in a certain vertical or using a certain technology, even if it's a derivative of technology it could be uh a chip manufacturer that wants to see more headsets being sold, which is like three degrees removed from them. 
or uh, new AR technology uh, that they want to understand what the market feasibility is. Um, so it's really interesting to sit right in between sort of the creators on one end and, and the corporations on the other hand, and both need something to connect it to. So tell me how anti-poaching walked into your uh, lead energy and direction. It's the natural outgrowth of being a talent agent, right? You start to work with people all the time and you're like, I like animals. <laughs> so that's, that's my story. No. Yeah. Uh, I watched the but, National Geographic once and I was like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a little more, a little more to that. Um, boss, do you want to tell the story? Yeah. Uh, for me, it started about 17 years ago on my first trip to Africa. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the short version. The, the longer version is over uh, at a campfire in Africa. Um, but basically, it was just a self-drive tour through uh, through South Africa, and part of that was uh, was a safari. And uh, you know, it was early early on career, small rental car, and uh, just driving around was was fascinating. But I had the immediate urge to be outside and actually be in nature and not sort of covered by a car. Um, and if you've been on safari, you kind of know what uh, what what the difference is, um, you know, in a car, there's no real engagement with nature. When you're outside the car, you're part of nature and you're not really on top of the food pyramid, let's, so, uh, let's say. Um, so the next, the second day, I rented the local uh, head ranger with a big rifle and we went out on, on foot for four hours and there were about six moments where we could have easily died and uh, I was sold. So for me, that was like, okay, I need to do this for my life. <laughs> uh, so I've been traveling Eastern and Southern Africa ever since uh, I got trained to Safari Field Guide in 2009. And that's where I got sort of the scientific and academic perspective on African wildlife, uh, which included understanding how populations are so rapidly declining that there were only 10 to 15 years left until the major keystone species are all gone. Um, and that's not fear mongering or let's, that's not a fear or something. The statistics show that. And despite billions going into that, uh, into, into conservation, um, there's only a small percentage that actually ends up in Africa. Uh, and therefore the efficacy is not there to actually save, uh, African wildlife from, ex from man-made extinction. And, um, and that dawned on me in 2009. The situation was grave and severe at the time. And we're 11 years later now. And the, line, the curve hasn't changed. Um, so we're not talking about the COVID curve in this time, in, in this instance, but the, the African wildlife curve, which is also negatively affected by COVID, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how the, uh, it's, so it started, um, you know, from a very innocent, you know, what tourist experience to becoming more and more serious as awareness developed. And it was in 2018 when, uh, uh, it really dawned on me. So this is uh, in, in my storyline that we just talked about 15 years of consulting work all over the world, uh, having launched a startup, advisor to startups, being on the venture capital side of things. And that's when it really dawned, like, if we want to structurally solve the problem of uh, of the eradication of the African wildlife, we can't be doing it the way we've already always been doing it through philanthropy and these these, these expensive institutions that do some projects. Uh, but don't really structurally address it. Um, and the way to solve it is the way we do startups and the way we, we break through, um, innovation and, uh, and, and change markets. So the, the, the keys are technology and investments. And once that clicked, uh, we were able to put together, uh, completely theoretical, but a strategy and a plan and actually the brand name, Sembezi and everything. Um, and, and then at some point when we started to socialize that amongst our friends in the tech community, uh, we got introduced to, um, these people in Zimbabwe. And that's where the whole things turned from just a plan to concrete opportunities, both on the conservation technology side and on the, the investment side. And we turned our, our plan into, you know, con actual concrete action plan. And uh, started going down the path of basically doing due diligence on, on everything on the ground in Zimbabwe in this, about a year ago in this, uh, June um, 2019, and found that everything that we had put on paper had substance, uh, a substance, and uh, we developed use cases. You know, we did uh, sort of the, the, the proper development approach to our own plan, 
And based on this use case, we're able to identify all the technologies that are out in the world and, uh, and were needed, uh, curated those, um, set up partnerships. And uh, now we're at the point where we're raising funding to uh, actually deploy it the moment uh, COVID allows us to go back into, into Zimbabwe. What would be one or two examples of technology that enhances conservation? Uh, one of the primary ones, which is pretty much at the heart of all uh, anti-poaching operations and human wildlife conflict prevention, or generally uh, sort of the management of a protected area, is uh, um, Vulcan's Earth Ranger, which is a controlling solution. It's a cloud-based solution. So Vulcan is a company that was founded by Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft. And uh, Vulcan, until recently, has always been entirely focused on uh, conservation in Africa. And they created a control room solution that takes in data from sensors um, and uh, allows for effective communication through radio systems with the rangers on the ground and the vehicles and uh, and cameras and acoustic sensors and all those things. Uh, brings it all together uh, in a centralized system and visualizes it on maps with satellite images. Uh, so just a random example, if an elephant is collared, and gives you know, a signal through satellite every 15 minutes, you'll see the elephant basically walking on your screens. Um, if the elephant doesn't move for too long, it will turn out the flag, say, hey, there's probably something going on here. Uh, and then you can deploy your rangers uh, on the ground or send out a helicopter or whatever is needed operationally. This is uh, as a very pragmatic example. So the investment fund is to then fund this technology or is it a broader mission and mandate? Um, it's complementary. So if you look at the conservation challenge in Africa, uh, at the, the, the ground level, there are basically two challenges. One is the prevention and the fighting of the actual poaching activities. This is where technology is the most helpful in terms of improving the efficacy, the efficiency. Now, the next level is the people that are poaching are poaching for a reason. Uh, either, and sometimes a combination of, they don't have the ability or they're not trained to or not educated to do any other work than what they've learned you know, uh, in poaching and often former military people that you know they have an AK-47 and this is the best and easiest way for them to make money. And on the other hand, it's local populations that uh, live in, in, in poverty and want to take care of their families and want to feed their families. And for many of them, this is the only way out to, to, to help themselves. And... The, the, the common denominator is they need to have an alternative source of income so that they don't have to go poaching. Um, and that applies not just to individuals, but the entire community. And the moment you serve, uh, you serve a community and you engage them in wildlife conservation and give them an economic incentive and involvement for conservation to succeed, then you solve the problem to a large extent. So what Zambezi Ventures does, it's, uh, it's a traditional venture fund. So with the traditional financial metrics, but entirely focused on high growth industries that also generates significant amount of jobs. And especially in areas where we can employ people that would otherwise be exposed to the, to the, uh, to the allure of making money through poaching. So it's really about, uh, creating jobs and providing alternative sources of income to the local populations. So no matter what type of innovation we talk about, you're, you're re-breaking and making an area where other people were already there. In the areas you're working in now, are and you feel free to, to, to answer this any way you're comfortable since this goes out into the public sphere, but are you stepping on toes who want to do things the way they've been done as part of their mission and mandate? Um, not really. Uh, we're just completely sidelining them like any startup would. Like if, you, if you're going to disrupt a supermarket chain, are you going to talk to the biggest supermarket to, to tell them, look, we're going to disrupt your model? Probably not. Um, no, we, we also, they need to keep doing what they're doing to a large extent because without them, it would even be less, right? Um, and wherever funds do flow into Africa and into projects, um, it does help. And also the partners that we're working with are partially funded by, by a large NGO and it got them off the ground and it got their operations going. 
and there's a clear limit to what they can do and cannot do. And we provide something that NGOs can't do by the nature of who they are, what they do, how they work, and the people that they have. So we're highly complementary, um, and we can run uh, as much as we want without ever running into them in a, in a negative way. Um, and I think there are a lot of opportunities in the future to, to collaborate. Um, and if you consider sort of the eight and a half thousand protective areas in sub-Saharan Africa as a market, then that market is extremely underserved, right? I think if, if in total two or 300 of those have some support from an NGO, then that's probably a lot. That's probably optimistic. So there is a lot of work to be done and it's kind of like a blue ocean strategy at this point. So you guys are fairly, in the grand scheme of things, fairly new and working together as a management team. With four different lines of business, how do you make decisions on what you should be spending your time and money on? I'll let Jenna take this one. <laughs> um, we care about that the people we're working with give us the energy to be able to work whatever hours in the day we have left on what we care about. We always seem to find time in the day. Of course, we need to generate income, but we're, we're fortunate. We've gotten this far in that we have done well and we have clients that are you know paying the bills, but we're, we're able to manage um, sort of all of them equally. And it's, it's sort of you, I hate saying this, you sort of jump when you get traction and, and it's it's first in sort of in a way. So we have our standard business bosses much more organized than I am. That's the management consulting side. Uh, I seem to be, you know, multitasking all the time. He's very focused. But when when we're able to connect with the tech companies who uh, say, hey, you know, we've got this new architecture. We're going to work with you on this and, and let's figure out these specs. You go, okay, you just get it done. Um, money is, the focus for us is raising money for um, the fund. The focus is raising money for uh, the uh, architecture, the first three years of development for this uh, connected platform that we were working on. And not to say that our clients are not important. They're very, very important because we're learning every day from them. The business models that we're you know, crafting for them in the emerging technology space is just so informative as to what we're doing if there's such connection but Vasa, if you agree with me i think you do we're doing what we're doing because this is our future and anything that puts us in a position to have an impact for the people on the ground in africa uh, to save animals and reduce those timelines to their you know very sad projections of 10 to 30 years losing keystone species that's our priority and uh, we we're our work ethic is pretty spectacular we'll get things done so a priority is uh, saving the planet and uh taking care of ourselves roof over our head we've, we've gotten this far in life sh shockingly uh we're doing okay any advice to young people who listen to this and go i want to skip all that consulting time i want to skip all of that um that working for a bunch of companies but this is cool i don't have to do one thing my whole life but how do i get to here quicker <laughs> Is it worth right. getting to hear it quicker or uh, yeah, anything mm -hmm. you tell your, your younger self, yeah. just skip that or more than that? Well, I think there are two sides of the coin. Uh, one is, you know, we, we're following our purpose now or a high purpose, uh, the way you want to frame it, which makes life really easy because there's a big flag on the horizon and, and you know, there's a straight line to that flag. Life means you know, there's no such thing as a straight line to, to, to a big goal. Um, but it makes life easier uh, because it, it makes it much more clear who you want to work with, who you don't want to work with, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. Um, the, 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 you know, the traditional separation between what's work and what's you know, for you personally kind of, uh, kind of blurs, which is really nice because it, things don't feel like work anymore. Um, and, you know, that's probably... Um, one of the uh, something that's people hear all the time, but finding your purpose makes makes a huge difference in life and, and just creates so much clarity um, and is, is highly energizing. At the same time, there's no such thing as a shortcut. Right? Um, I guess some people find their uh, 
uh, their their purpose when they're when they're 18. Some some people find it when they're 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 68. Um, luckily, we're neither of those. Um, but there's also a reality check, which is, had we not had our careers in all those subsequent order uh, and all those different experiences that have all been building one after the other on top of one another, and one creating a new opportunity and it creates a new opportunity. None of this would have been possible. None of this would have happened. So had either one of us taken a shortcut earlier, earlier in life, this, none of this would have existed, right? So there's, there's no such thing as rushing through life and jumping to trying to jump to the end because you won't have the experience to deliver ultimately. Right? Um, so there are two sides of that coin, I think. So we are near the end of our conversation. It's been great talking to you guys. Is there anything that you'd like to mention we haven't talked about? Hmm. And if not, that's fine. <laughs> well, we welcome the opportunity to share our experience being the interpreters and intersection of media and technology. We have worked and touched pretty much every uh, new platform and tech out there. And we were happy to be a sounding board, if not uh, work on some projects, because we love the state of the industry. We love that there's forward momentum and, and so much innovation. It's exciting for us because the same AI that's now being used in entertainment, it's the AI that we're using in our cameras to identify, you know, different species of animals. So, so it, it all is important to us. So we are welcoming a, uh, Anybody who has cool stuff that they want to talk to us about. At the same time, we have um, hit sort of a, a hard stop uh, in conservation because of COVID. And something I just would love to mention is that if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, we actually have a fundraiser coming in December. Yes, it's plug that Endangered thing. Rangers. What? Plug it, yes. <laughs> I'm plugging. I'm plugging, but it's important. It's a great way Absolutely. to... to get people to know what we're doing, um, especially on the technology side. Um, so December 13th uh, on endangeredrangers.com, it's a fundraiser to support the men and women on the front lines of conservation, the rangers. They are suffering the same economic challenges because tourism has stopped in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's what supported them. And if they're not on the front lines, poaching is increasing. Therefore, we are supporting them. We have a great celebrity-filled fundraiser that's also informative that will give the stories of people on the ground and talk about both their lives and the programs that are happening on the ground, as well as the technology that's being used that we've mentioned here before and how that's going to complement what they do, how that's going to um, help us stay on track to save these animals. So. That's that's something we, we didn't mention, and I will plug it. So please tune in on endangeredrangers.com or on your Connect K-N-E-K-T TV app on Roku or I, uh, Apple I, I, iTunes, I think it is. Sorry, we're both Android people. Uh, so that's what we're working on. We're doing anything that we can to take advantage of you know, people's attention about so many global issues. Uh, there's so many wonderful causes right now. We just want to make sure that everyone knows that there's uh, human challenges happening all over the world and the planet and the people are, are important. So we thank you for supporting us with the consulting work. We thank you for supporting uh, what we're doing on the, uh, on the environmental side. Great. Any uh, other than those two or, or the links there, which I'll put in the show notes, is there any other way people can reach out to you? Uh, yeah, the easiest way is always through LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I guess so the names the names will be there. Uh, I think we, we're both pretty responsive there. That's always a good starting point. And given that we both have like eight or 10 different email addresses from different ventures and stuff, <laughs> the easiest is to go through LinkedIn because then we'll sort out how to communicate from there. LinkedIn or ZambeziPartners.com is our website as well. You can always contact us through our info link. There. Great. And we'll have that in the show notes as well. Thank you guys for joining me. And I'm so glad to hear of your adventures. And I'm looking forward to seeing them going forward. Thank you. Well, there's the adventure. I hope you found this inspirational. If you are interested, please find them to participate in their work through our show notes or their social media and come back to future episodes of Creative Innovators to get inspired in your work. And if you'd like to rebuild your career this coming holiday season, if you're listening to this in December of 2020, 
Come find us at nextcareer.me to take our next career program to figure out what you might do as your new adventures as a creative innovator.